subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV. Hello and welcome. Welcome, friends, to your favorite tele educative program on Joy Learning on your number one TV station, Joy TV. Once again, it is history, not any other history, but African history. And as we say it always, it's African history time. It's your history and it's my history. It's the history of the continent. So it is important we gather, listen, take notes, and be proud of whatever we are going to study. So once again, this is um, Senior High School 2, that is Form 2 History. And today we'll be looking at the arts, the arts, history of visual arts. So critical. In every civilization, the component of the arts is so crucial. And it speaks to the civilization of the people. And you can check across the world. Every civilization boasts of its arts. And Ghanaian civilization or African civilization is of no exception. So exactly that is what we are going to be looking at today. And it's on the visual arts history of visual arts. So stick with me. Stay with me. Take your pens. Take your exercise books. And let's do this together with pride. Once again, it's history time. It is African history time. Let's set sail. So as I indicated, this is Senior High School History Form 2, and we'll be looking at history of visual arts. Very interesting topic. All right, so visual arts and crafts formed important aspects of the civilization of Ghanaians in the pre-colonial period. And when I began um, this whole discussion, I started by saying that the arts are so crucial in the civilization of every, of, of every civilization indeed. Because it, it takes a civilized mind to come out with the arts. And that's why I'm saying Ghanaian civilization or the African civilization is no exception. So it is just apt that we begin today's discussion with this opening sentence. So visual arts and crafts formed important aspects of the civilization of Ghanaians in the pre-colonial period. Visual arts express the religious and philosophical thoughts of the people. So who told you? that our societies, our communities, did not express their philosophies um, in, in diverse ways. Take it, if it was not written, it was expressed in the arts. And that is how civilized Ghanaians, or we have been before the coming in of the European or before pre-colonial period. So that's Ghanaians carved, wove, and manufactured items to control their environment. This discussion examines the various forms of arts produced by pre-colonial Ghanaians and their significance in the lives of the people. This is loaded. We are going to look at the significance of the arts that our people produced, its relevance in the lives of the people. And so, as I indicated, stick with me with rapt attention. Take your exercise books, your pens, and begin to take down the notes. Once again, this is Senior High School Form 2, and it's African history time. All right, so we'll begin with the murals, murals, architectural arts. So murals refer to beautiful wall paintings which depict the lives of people. The initiated receive messages through such paintings. Among the paintings included a bird with its head turned backwards. I am sure um, with, this, with this description, we're able to um, picture the kind of bird I'm talking about. You remember Sankofa? Yes, that's exactly, and, and it's loaded with meaning. And that is a philosophy that our people had or they bore before the coming in of the European. Our people were so much loaded with philosophy. And that is what we are saying. So among the paintings included a bird with its head turned backwards. This educated people that they would not be committing any crime if they forgot something and went back for it. We, we began our discussion by saying that the art forms were philosophical and played a significant role in the lives of our people. And this is just one um, of the things that we are going to be looking at. And it's so significant. We are saying that the bird with its head turned around 
signifies that you would not be committing any crime if you forgot something and you went back for it. I mean, how loaded in wisdom this uh, painting is. All right, other artifacts like masks, statues, drums were also painted. Besides architectural arts in Ghana included clay work. Clay molding took place everywhere in Ghana, but due to its fragile nature, very little of it could be found in museums in modern times. It is significant to note that some of these artifacts that we can't find in our museums, strangely, can be found in European museums. Not too long ago, um, it has started happening, and I know it will continue to happen. Artifacts from Nigeria, artifacts from Benin, and other places which were stolen by the colonialists have begun flowing in um, to their places of origin and birth. And so it is not surprising, even though how fragile um, clay works um, can be, we know that some of these works can be found in European museums. All right, so these handicrafts were preserved in places or in palaces of kings and museums. Let me take this again because it's so significant. You see, clay modeling took place everywhere in Ghana, but due to its fragile nature, very little of it could be found in museums um, in modern times. Ivory, wood, brass, and gold were also used to express traditional artworks. These handicrafts were preserved in palaces of kings and museums. All right, so in your shot is a beautiful picture of a Ghanaian painting signifying the bird with its head turned around, which is signifying that if you forgot something and you went back for it, it is never a crime. This is deep in wisdom and philosophy. This is Sankofa, and I know you know, this is Sankofa. The bird with its head turned around, meaning that when you forgot something and you went back for it, it is never a crime. This is one of the murals. Okay, so we now we go to wood carving. We started by looking at the murals, the architectural paintings or the architectural arts. And we ended by having a look at a picture that signifies um, a bird with its head turned around. And the, the meaning and the wisdom of it is that when you forgot something, when you made a mistake and you corrected yourself, there's nothing wrong with it. It is even, it is even important that we do that. When we forgot something, we have to go back, make corrections, make amends, and society would move on. And that is a philosophy carried by Ghanaians, by Ghanaians. All right, so when we say woodworks, a picture of um, this passionate man carving an artifact is quickly displayed. We are looking at wood carvings. We are looking at carvings. And quickly, I want to draw your attention to the Ebri wood carving village, where you could go on an excursion to see the beautiful artworks that our people are doing out there. That is one place that you could go and see for yourself some beautiful um, artworks by um, our own people. So we are looking at wood, um, wood carvings, and it's a picture of, as I indicated, a passionate wood carver carving an image. All right, so wood was Ghana's favorite uh, material, which, um, as a boat of spirits, became living material for a soul. The hard, termite-resistant wood was preferred for sculpture. This included mahogany and ebony varieties. So we had, or we have a number of trees that are so um, good for wood carvings. And you can mention mahogany, you can mention um, ebony, you can even mention wawa and the rest. These are uh, wood lots that are so uh, important for wood carvings. A striking feature of Ghanaian sculpture was that it was carved from a single piece of wood. Instead of making them up from separate parts, the unwanted material was cut away from the piece of wood so as to produce an art object. And with, with this description going on, as I also told you earlier, the Brie Wood Carving Village is one perfect place where you could go pass by as a student of African history and see for yourself some of the works that um, the people are doing there and these descriptions will play out perfectly well for you when you visit that place. All right, craftsmen of the same profession generally formed themselves into guilds, in which members obeyed certain well-defined professional methods of carving. So if you were a woodcarver, it was a respected profession 
and they went by some ethics. It was not just anyhow, anybody goes in there and no. This was a well-respected profession where ethics were preserved and respected. They followed laid down rules and conventions and other customary procedures. If they kicked against any of them, they performed purification rites and other rituals to appease or propitiate the gods or deities associated with their crafts. So it tells you how sacred wood carving was, and I believe strongly that it is still a very sacred and important profession. That when you are into it, you are espousing the philosophy and the wisdom of the Ghanaian culture. The traditional wood cover depended on tools like the axe, knife, um, the cross cutting axes and cutlass. These were some of the tools that the, um, the wood cover used. And we've mentioned the axe, the knife, um, the cross cutting axes, and cutlass. Later, modern tools like saw, chisel wraps, lefts, drilling machines, etc., were also brought, brought into the picture. Moreover, the introduction of all paints of, or, or colors were recently made most traditional artists um, give their work some multicolored appearance. What we are saying is that the, the traditional tools that were used um, in pre-colonial times were the knife, the axes, the cross-cutting axes, and the cutlasses. But with the, with the, with the movement of time, um, modern tools, if you like, like saw, like chisels, have also, and drilling machines have also been um, introduced. There's also an introduction of colors. Of course, when you look at some of these artifacts, some of them are painted in, um, in various shades. And we are saying these are all um, later introduction after um, colonialism. All right, so in your picture is um, some of the tools that the woodcarver used. You could see the hammer, you could see the chisel, you could see the saw, and you could see um, clearly um, on your screen some of the, some of the tools that the wood cover you. So wherever you find is an exam, a multiple choice, or whatever, and you are asked to identify some of the tools that the wood cover used, it should quickly come to mind, as you have seen on the screen. So easy, and I know you can identify with it. And I encourage you to visit um, places that I've just mentioned, the wood carving village. Um, you come to the art center in Accra, you can find some of these tools there, and you have a very, um, what we call relia, you can feel and touch it, there and it will help you in understanding the topic um, pretty well. All right, craftsmen attached to their profession some ritual practices. Their workshops and tools had to be consecrated by the pouring of libation and the offering of the blood of animals and birds, such as sheep and fowls, before work began. There were occasions when members of the guild underwent special religious observances. Most carvers left the marks of their axe strokes showing. Those who preferred the round style polished the surfaces with wet coarse leaves or sandpaper and then left the works for a time in the mud or in itching bath for I mean, these were all ways of beautifying the artworks that our forebears were into. And as we have seen, to be a wood carver was a sacred profession. And so, for you to come out with a final work, it went through certain processes. You need to leave them in the sun, you need to polish them, you need to, you know, adore them with certain um, elements to make the works uh, more beautiful and appealing to the sight of anyone who came across. And so that is why we are looking at it in this direction. That it was a sacred work. It was a sacred profession. Um, like every other profession, I mean, certain rituals are, are undertaken. And as we have seen here, the tools were consecrated before they went to work. Um, some libations were poured. And it was all to give them the inspiration, the inspiration to come out with artifacts or artifacts that will be deep and deeper in philosophy and meaning. And exactly that is what we are looking at. We are looking at the history of visual arts for senior high school form two. And we are looking at the, the, the significance of these artworks in the lives of the ordinary person in the Ghanaian society in pre-colonial times. Others bent them with red hot iron or painted them with soot resin and oil. And it's all an attempt to make the artworks look beautiful. So some of them were bent, some of them oils were applied to them to look very appealing. 
And if the people were not civilized, if the people were not deep in there, um, in terms of thoughts, they would not be able to produce some of these works. And that is why we are saying the visuals, the artworks, play a significant role in the civilization of any society. And the Ghanaian society is no exception as a very civilized one before the coming in of the European. Many masks were painted, uh, most of them with black and white color. White, um, the colors of spirits, places one in the protection of the spirits. Red was used to express joy and happiness. Some people adorned their wooden figures and masks um, like beloved living beings with leon clothes, bracelets, and chains of metal, glass, beads, seed, and, and shells. So this is exactly what we are saying. That because we adore and we, we respected the artworks that our woodcarvers produce, the, the final figures were adorned with several things. Some of them were adorned with white um, calico, some of them were adorned with beads, some of them were polished with oil, some of them were bent, and it was all an attempt to give it some aesthetics, to make it so beautiful. And it also had meaning. And as we move on, we'll get to know and understand some of the, some of the meanings that were associated with the artworks that our people produced. Now, the point I want to emphasize on in relation to the history of visual arts is that the arts were a significant component in the civilization of our people. And so if you have looked at wood carvings, if you have looked at the murals, it tells you how skillful our people were and how deep in mindset, how deep in philosophy they also were. And they expressed these philosophies in the artworks that they produced. And so that is exactly what I want you to have it out there and, and be proud as um, a, student of, a student of African history who is learning your own history, the Ghanaian history. In the early days, wood carving was regarded as sacred, as I have told you earlier. Wood carving was a sacred profession, a very respectable profession. This was because kings and priests employed their carvers to produce objects which had religious significance. So indeed, if you look at the, at the regalia, the chief's regalia, the, the language staff and all, these were carved by the wood cover. And for you to carve the, the language staff, it is indeed a sacred job. And that is why we consider it as a sacred job and it had a lot of respect. And it also earned respect from the communities. Other objects that concern the throne, like royal stools and drums, were also carved. So for you to carve the, the royal stool, for you to carve the etumpai, for you to carve the fontom from, which were played and are still played in the chief's palace, and we know the significance of our chiefs as being the intermediary between the living and the dead, then anything that is associated with this institution should be sacred. And that's exactly what our wood carvers um, did and they continue to do and that is why we say that profession was sacred and a respectable one. Some of these were um, domestic utensils apart from producing um, artifacts for the palaces they also produced for domestic use. So utensils like mortars and pestles for pounding and I'm I, I, I'm excited because I know as African history students, you like your fufu. And so the pistols and the mortars, the moment I mention it, you are laughing because probably this afternoon or evening, you'll be eating fufu. And these important tools were produced and are still being produced by our wood covers. So pots for keeping water, dishes, cups, ladles, spoons, and wooden basins for washing clothes. The most important, the significant aspect of this is that it came with no side effect when you used it because these were a natural wooden, natural woods, uh, even with some medicinal properties which our forebears used. And that's how come they live long. Instead of us today using all kinds of aluminum and other you know, utensils that have some health implications on us. But we are saying that the utensils that they use, the ladles for, for stews, the ladles for, for cocoa and the rest were all produced from wood. And so it tells you that they were very natural um, utensils that our forebears used for domestic purposes. So for keeping water, for dishes that they ate in, the cups and everything was produced by the wood cover. 
Carvers also produce other objects, including dolls, used at religious shrines and for play. Some wood carvers or wood sculpture was made to represent ancestors. Other pieces of traditional wood carving were used to influence events. Let me take this again. And it, the significance of this is that the, 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 the final works of the wood carvers were so profound and significant. They produced dolls for religious purposes at the shrines for play. So instead of us uh, using a lot more of dolls that do not look like us, especially for our kids, we should produce or we should have dolls that are so close to us in terms of identity so that we can identify with it and be happy with it and be proud with it other than using other products that do not look like us and therefore we strive to look like those dolls which has its own health and other um, implications in terms of esteem. So other pieces of traditional wood carving were used to influence events. All right. For example, the Asante Equiaba, and we're talking about the Equiaba doll, was a fertility doll carried by pregnant women in order to bear perfect and beautiful children. So um, in pre-colonial times, if somebody was pregnant, the person would have gone for an Equiaba doll. The beautiful one adorned with beads and all kinds of materials. Beautiful one, well polished. And the significance of this was that when you held it as a pregnant woman, you were going to give birth to a very beautiful, perfect um, black lady or young boy as a result of the fertility doll that the pregnant woman carried. And that is how sacred the products of the wood covers um, were. And I still think that still they are so sacred. Wood carving became an important occupation for many Ghanaians because covers were held in great esteem in the traditional society. People were endowed with a skill to carve entered the profession. Others too gained the skill through learning from experienced carvers. So if, you're, if your father was a wood carver and as a young boy, you could be introduced to the profession and then you also become a wood carver. But the bottom line is that people who were wood carvers were well as respected. They had um, respect in the community because the profession was, um, was, was a sacred profession. And therefore, anybody who went into it must have had the skill to be able to produce what was expected of him. In pre-colonial time, people who were in wood carving a lot of times were, were male, were men. Women were not so much into wood carving. So when you came to the beads, bead making, and soap making and the rest, that is where you found a lot of women. But the wood carving was more or less a preserve for, um, for, for men. And it's of no disrespect um, to the women because that is how our, our forebears ancestors wanted it to be, and so it was respected as such. So there in your shot is a Kuaba doll. A Kuaba doll. I mean, it's a beautiful uh, wood carving. Look at the neck with some, um, if you like, beads around the neck. Um, I mean, this is, a, this is a beautiful one. And the, the expectation is that any pregnant woman who carried this doll was going to give birth to a perfect, beautiful baby, just like the doll. And the doll is nice. I mean, the color is even nicer. All right, so brass casting. We've looked at murals. We've looked at wood carving. We are going to look at brass casting. Brass casting. Another area in which Ghanaians showed their artistic skills was the production of brass works. The practice of casting in brass was known in areas like Asante. And it's true. Today, when you go to... Um, the cultural center in, As in, in Asante, when you go to the cultural center in Kumasi, you find a lot of these brass works, very nice ones uh, being displayed in front of the, um, I mean, as I just mentioned. The practice of casting in brass was known in areas like Asante, as I've mentioned, in the royal courts. Such marvelous works as brass kudu were produced by casting. The kudwo were sole containers in brass of two types, the box type and the vast type. These cult vessels were used for purification or to holding offerings. So those were containers which were used for purification. Some lace would be put into it um, together with water and would be used to sprinkle for purifications. Or they were used as offerings. They were used as offerings. 
Well, the name I wanted to mention was the cultural center. The cultural center. When you go to Kumasi, you find a lot of these brass casting works. All right. At death, the kudu was, was filled with gold ornaments and curry shells and buried with the owner. The lid of the kudu was decorated with figures. The serepedu, a French expression meaning lost wask or lost wask technique, was used in brass casting. By this method, the figure was first formed in wax. So if you wanted to create any of the figures that we will get to see um, in the course of time, you would have created the, the figures in a wax. And when you, you, you cut it out, then you can, you can have the figure in the, the brass as it were. In case of larger works, around the core of clay. So let me take it. By this method, the figure was first formed in wax. In the case of larger works, around the core of clay. So you can also mold it in a clay to have the figure before you, you transfer it onto the brass to have it um, done. The creations and details were added by means of thread of wax. The model was then surrounded with clay, which was formed into the slittest markings in the wax original. When the clay covering had set, it was heated so that the wax would melt and run out. So when you have the wax melted and run out, then you, you have the figure, as we'll get to see very soon. This was why it was called a lost wax method, or a repedio. So if you wanted to form a figure, you first molded it in a, in a wax, in addition to clay. When you heat it and the wax uh, melts, then you have the figure in the clay. To release the casting, the clay mold would have to be broken so that it will also um, so that it was also known as a lost mold technique. So also known as a lost mold technique. We are looking at the brass casting, and we are saying that for you to have the final object, it goes through a certain process. And for this process to have you know imprinted on the minds of our people in pre-colonial times tells you the advance meant in terms of their philosophical thinking, in terms of their civilization. That at the time, they knew these techniques and they were using it to produce such wonderful um, features. It tells you how civilized our people were. In addition to the lost wax process, Ghanaians also practiced casting in molds and many other methods of metal working, such as chiseling. It must be noted that brass weights produced from casting were used in weighing gold dust. This practice of brass casting was started in Ghana as far back as the 19th century. This was way back before our contact with the Europeans. And a picture beautifully um, shown to you on your screen is the brass kudu. See the lid. The lid is, um, I think, some, some chameleons. I mean, this is how beautiful the, the brass looked like. And this one, we said it was used for offering and it was also used for, for sacrifices. And sacrifices here, I mean, it will be used for sprinkling um, of water and some leaves. And it was meant to ward off some spirits, evil spirits, as we believed in, from coming close. And this is a perfect picture of brass kudu, which is a handiwork of brass casting. I trust that you are following the discussion and we are making meaning out of the civilization of Ghanaians before the coming in of the European. Leather works, leather works, leather works. So far we've looked at the murals, so far we've looked at the wood carvings, and we've also looked at brass casting. These were all um, handy works, artifacts that our people were involved in in pre-colonial times. And it was not just involved in, they were producing artifacts with significance. They had meaning, deeper meaning um, to them. So now we look at leatherworks, leatherworks. All right, so in your picture are some um, products of, of leatherworks. So you can find bags, you can find sandals, you can find wallets, and, and a host of items produced um, from leather. Leather Work was said to have developed in the savannah areas of the north, as well as Accra Plains and the lower Volta. Why reason is that you can find a lot of these um, animals in the northern part of our country, you can find them in the Accra Plains and in the lower Volta. 
And of course, when we say leather works, then you will need to have the cattle to, or the sheep to take off their skins to produce these works. So cattle, sheep, and goats survive more in these areas, and it's true even up to today. Therefore, hides and skins were readily obtained for use in leather work. Very often, the hides were tanned and dyed before being used. It is very correct. By this method, the workers in leather were able to produce a variety of colors to suit their customers. When they tan it and when they dyed it, then they had a variety of colors to produce a variety of, um, of objects. And that is the significance of the dyeing or the tanning of the ties or the leather. And we are saying that the leather was gotten from the northern part of the savannah area, the Accra Plains, and Lower Volta. Why? Because those areas were suitable for um, rearing or keeping sheep, goats, and um, cattle. People used leather in various forms for clothing and footwear, like sandals, um, boots, shoes. Others were able to um, produce bags, sandals, um, knife shells, um, sword, that is sword shells. You can put your, your sword or knife in that pocket, which is designed with um, leather. Leather cushions in your, in your homes. And I know as we speak, some of you have leather cushions. And waistbands used by children. You can keep your money in, in those things. Leather works were also produced for decoration. And it's true. In our homes, we have um, artifacts or artifacts which are designed and designed by or with leather and they are meant to produce some aesthetics decoration in our homes they were sold to the local elite merchants non-african and other strangers it is true i mean one economic benefit of leather works is that you produce the the, the works and then you sell them it is for beautification that is aesthetics and you can also sell them out to make a living out of it the finished leather products or products were exported to other markets. Sometimes they were exchanged with other goods from other areas. So important was the leather industry that many people, particularly males, practiced it as their main occupation. Others made it as a hobby after a day's work in the field. So um, leather work was also primarily an occupation for, for the males. And we are saying that uh, it was meant for decoration. You could produce, uh, you could have products from leather that is meant for decoration in your homes. You can also have them as sandals, um, uh, uh, bags, and, and what have you. A lot, of, a lot of products that could be produced with leather. And it's important to also note that people made a living out of it, which improved their standard of living. At present, leather is used as industrial belting for power transmissions, gloves, jackets, and other clothing, luggage, upholstery, and sports equipment. So leather is used in various ways. All right. It's used in various forms and in various ways. The traditional leather work has now declined due to the availability of goods produced in modern machine-run factories. Yes, so now plastics are being used uh, which are not healthy anyway, but they are very much competing with leather. Most artworks in Ghana were in gold and others in metals. This was due to the abundance of gold as the land was endowed with it. And that is why we were known as, and we are still known as a gold coast, as a gold coast. The lost wax techniques was used. Others were um, chased or chiseled or hammered. Gold products range from personal ornaments to state swords and language stuff. All right, gold was weighed by a small balance and several sets of um, very pretty or petty weights called emremo, emremo, this is an account word, which were cast from metal. Gold was carved into human figures, parts of human body, birds, animals, fish, insects, parts of animals, and vegetation notives. Also, instruments like tools, domestic articles, weapons, drums, etc., were carved. All right, so in a picture, 
right there in your shot is a, it's a figure that is carved out of these minerals. So it's a mother with a baby on its lap sitting on a stool. This is a beautiful work um, by our forebears. Now cloth weaving, cloth weaving, cloth weaving. Now we have looked at we are the history of visual arts, and we've looked at some of the the the, the works, some of the arty works that our people produced when it came to visuals. And we've said we've looked at murals, we've looked at wood carving, we've looked at um, leather works, we've looked at um, goldsmithing. Now we are looking at cloth making. We are looking at cloth making. Cloth weaving was highly developed in the savannah as well as the forest belt before the coming of the Europeans. Some of the first forms of cloth produced in Ghana were from the skins of large animals. Others were produced from the back of some soft trees. The Akan, for example, were known to have produced cloth from the back of the Chen Chen tree. So if it comes to the multiple choice and you, you, you see Chen Chen tree there, you know that it's the back of a tree that our forebears produced cloth from. As time went on, the use of cotton to make cloth became widespread. The arts of spinning and weaving now became important. After the threads had been fitted into the loom, the hands and feet were used to operate the traditional looms. The cloths were initially woven in long strips. After the weaving had been completed, they were sewn together with needles to produce larger cloths. Having finished their cloths, they were often dyed in many colors. Sometimes some were painted with beautiful designs. And before I show you any picture, I want you to cast your mind to the beautiful Kente cloth that we see around during Derbe's festivals and all manner of festival occasions when we go to church. We see them beautifully woven, beautiful uh, design with beautiful colors and sometimes with some um, designs in them. All right, so in the picture there is a, is a young man in his Kente weaving um, a Kente cloth. And you can see the way the hands are, the looms, how the feet are moving up and down. This is the traditional way of producing a cloth, and that is a kente cloth. And this is prominent in both the Akan areas and in Volta region. Weaving of cloth became the occupation of men and women who possessed the gift of weaving through apprenticeship uh, with skilled weavers. Many people acquired a skill. It then became a money-making business in many areas in Ghana, particularly Asante and Everland. The traditional cloth like the Kente and the Dinkra were exported to neighboring states and kingdoms. Cloth was used as a medium of exchange in pre-colonial period. Traditional cloth was battered for commodities from other states. And of course, when we mention butter, you know, in exchange for another commodity in silence. Chiefs and other important personalities often wore the rich and um, very rich products like the kente. And I, as I said, you could see this during festivals, during funerals, during church services. You see our chiefs and, and all of us in our kente cloth beautifully woven and designed. Many people wore them for social gatherings. The traditional cloth weaving industry also brought a, a boom to the local cotton cultivation. Cotton farmers were provided with ready markets for their produce. And it's true up to today that anybody, so we go to uh, Bone Ray in Ashanti region, it's a very booming place for the production of kente cloth for both um, inland use and for exportation. Now dyeing, dyeing, dyeing. We've said some of the, even with, um, with leather, some of them were tanned and dyed. So, the art of dyeing or the skill of dyeing was something that was important to our um, visual artists or our artists. So let's look at what dyeing is. Dyeing. Traditionally, dyes were prepared from barks, roots, and leaves of trees. So these were a very organic and natural way of producing colors. They were produced from barks of trees, roots, and leaves of trees, which were boiled with a material. So whatever, so if it was a leather, you boil the leather um, with the back of the tree or the leaves or the roots and it gave you the color. 
So if it was a wood carving, you did the same and it gave you a color. For example, the back of the mango tree produced yellow dyes. I mean, this is straightforward, very organic and natural. The back of a mango tree produced a yellow color. So if you wanted to dye a product in a yellow, uh, with a yellow color, the best way uh, to go about it was to have the back of mango trees, boil them, and boil them with the object that you want to dye. Things usually dyed were cloth and straw for mats and basket weaving. Tie dyeing, tie dyeing. In this process, cloth was folded and tied or bunched around stones. So tie and dye as we, 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 we usually call it. I mean, how to make tie and dye. This is how it was done. It was folded and tied or bunched around stones and ties before dyeing. When this was done, the dye covered the cloth in an uneven pattern. It might even have some sections on dye. And this was the design that you find in the cloth. So whatever design you want to have, you tie the cloth around it, you put it in the dye, you boil it, and then when you, you, you take it out and you remove whatever you attach to it, either the stone, you would have seen a design in the cloth. And this was a skill that our people had way back before our contact, and this was what we call pre-colonial times. And it all had some significance in terms of the designs that they produced. Resist or resist dyeing. In this technique, the cloth was covered with a, a paste made out of starch. Patterns could be drawn through the starch so that at the dyeing stage, the dye will, would only affect the parts of the cloth that were not covered with starch. Sometimes a metal stencil in which shapes had been cut could be used instead of the starch. And these were all um, skills and techniques to produce designs and make the cloth beautiful and appealing when they finally come out as such. Now, batik. Batik. And I know when we mention batik, up to today we know what batik is. This was an art of textile design and which was produced by a negative dyeing method. It was marked out in wax, that's resist dyeing, before the fabric was dipped so that the wax portions did not absorb the dye and stood out in the original color of the fabric. And so where do you get the colors from? The colors were gotten from the back of trees, from leaves, and from the roots. And these were very natural, authentic colors. And if you wanted to, to um, produce a, a cloth, like a batik tie and dye, you only have the design. You put it in this um, boiled leaves or roots, in, I mean in water, you dip the material in, and before you rinse it or you bring it out, you would have gotten your design and pattern. And these were skills that our people had before pre-colonial time or before we had contact with Europeans. So originally the hot wax was applied to the fabric by a sharp strip of bamboo. Dyeing played an interesting role in the history of customs in most Ghanaian indigenous societies. For example, the yellow color, and as we mentioned, the yellow color was gotten from the back of mango trees. When you boil the mango tree, the back of it, it gave you the color yellow. This is a traditional, or this is a natural color that we have learned today. So for instance, the yellow color in the traditional dyeing industry stood for honor, royalty, and wealth. And of course, from our national flag, we know it. The yellow color signifies wealth. It signifies the gold of this country. They were therefore used mainly by traditional rulers. Red meant bravery. Red meant bravery. And as we all know from our national colors, red means the blood that was lost. And it was not just lost by anybody, but the brave ones, the brave ones who died saving our country. So red meant bravery, courage, strength, and endurance. This color was sometimes used for war dresses. So if anybody was going to war, and when people are, you know, in that mood, it was only red. They always dress in red. Black stood for grief and sorrow and was used for mourning cloth. All right, so with black, um, from what we have just seen, um, red was for bravery, 
yellow for wealth and black for grief. But black also signified victory at times. I mean, black is not always for grief and sorrow. Black is also elegance. Black is also um, strength. And black is also courage. So it is not only for grief and mourning. So blue was for peace, piety, and serenity. Blue was for peace, um, piety, and serenity. So there are about four colors that we have seen and their significance. Yellow for, for wealth, red for bravery, courage, strength, and endurance. Um, and we've seen black for grief and sorrow. But we've also added that our, our forebears also saw black as, as um, bravery, as courage, and also as endurance. Um, so black is really beautiful and strong. All right, and we say blue was for peace, piety, and serenity. Traditional dyeing was a very profitable business for many people. The commonest one was the dyeing of Corbin. Corbin, and I know when I mention Corbin, uh, which you know Corbin is a cloth, was a popular morning cloth in the Akan traditional society. So when prominent people pass on, you will hear in the news, uh, the attire is Corbin, Corbin, and that is what we are talking about. It's a cloth that is used for mourning. All right, so let's look at the importance of the traditional dyeing industry. We have indicated that the dyeing industry was so important and significant in the Ghanaian society before the coming of Europeans. But then what are the importance? The importance. The traditional dyeing industry served as employment avenues for the youth. So one important um, bit of the dyeing industry was that it provided employment. The manufacturing of Edinkra and Kento cloths at Bone Ray in Asante, for instance, attracted many young boys and girls to the area to look for employment. The dyeing industry also produced items which came to serve as substitutes for the imported foreign dyes. Many of the traditional dyes were also exported to neighboring states. Three, the industry was also important for the fact that old and new cloths were often red dyed. So if you had an old cloth, you could quickly take it back, they dye it, and it becomes beautiful and new. And that is one significance of the dyeing industry. This usually gave old clothes some new appearances. And I think still we do it. If you have some old um, cloth there, you could take it back, you could dye it, and it becomes so nice. All right. So in effect, let us do a quick recap of what we have done. Today, we have been looking at the history of visual arts. We have said that the, the arts are a very significant portion of the civilization of any society anywhere in the world, and Ghanaian society is no exception. We've looked at the fact that the, the arts had significance. They were not just produced, but they, they, they were of philosophical meanings. And we've looked at the murals, we've looked at the paintings, and we saw um, the Sankofa, the bed with its head turned. This is so deep in, in, in wisdom and philosophy. And what it meant was that when you forgot something, when you go back for it, you had not seen. It is even wise that you, you do that. We've looked at wood carving. We looked at the, the significance of the wood carving industry. We saw it as a very sacred enterprise. We saw it as um, a profession that was so much held, held in, 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 in high esteem. So that is what we have done. We've looked at the brass casting, and finally we looked at leather works, and we've looked at weave, um, the kente weaving, cloth weaving. So that is how far we have come. I will never leave you without an exercise. So identify three Ghanaian artifacts and their significance in the Ghanaian society. You are to do this. Identify three Ghanaian artifacts and their significance in the Ghanaian society. So that is all. For us today, um, where the materials were gotten from, History of Africa for Senior High Schools in Ghana, World of Series, you can find copies at the University of Ghana Bookshop. Go get it simply written, English, easy to understand. Please let us enjoy our history, be proud of our history, because it is said that with people without history, it's like a tree without roots. And because we have roots, let us know our history and be proud. Thank you so much, my friends, for joining me. Once again, it is history, African history time on your Joy Learning Center on um, Joy TV. My name is Frank Edu Asari. Thank you. Same time next week. We catch up. Bye. -bye.
subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV.